Hello, I am uh, Dr. John Nordling of Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne, and it's my great privilege to uh, lead you through here uh, the texts for uh, Proper 8b, which by my reckoning is Pentecost 5, uh, Series B. And I'm going to be doing the epistle. Uh, I already did the gospel some time ago, so now we're doing epistles and Old Testament lessons. So, uh, let's begin then with the prayer for this day, the collect of the day. We pray, Heavenly Father, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. By the healing medicine of the word and sacraments, pour into our hearts such love toward you that we may live eternally through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, um, this being, of course, the epistle lesson, the Lectio Continua in the old uh, liturgical way of looking at it, there's no immediate connection to the Old Testament or the Gospel. Uh, the Gospel lesson for this day, of course, is Mark 5, 21 to 43. That's Jairus' daughter, the the raising of Jairus' daughter and the woman who touched Jesus' garment. And so you can see those themes um, very much reflected in the collect of the day. Uh, uh, during his earthly ministry, your son Jesus healed the sick, of course, and raised the dead. So that's what happens in the gospel lesson. And then the healing medicine of the word and sacraments. Pour into our hearts such love toward you now, there may be a slight uh, connection to the epistle lesson because Paul does twice mention agape uh, uh, in the uh, epistle lesson, but it's pretty slight. So, let's get right in then to the, to the lesson itself, which is 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 9, and 13 to 15. And as you know, um, this portion of the letter... Uh, concerns um, Paul's uh, counsel to the Corinthians of being liberal in their giving and also organizing the offering for the saints, namely the saints in Jerusalem. So these two chapters are really important for giving in general, Christian giving, and provide some of our best evidence for Paul's original historic uh, organizing the church for the needy saints in Jerusalem. So, anyway, um, Paul then begins here, Gnorizomen de humen adelfoi tain karen tu theu. So, and we make known to you, brethren, uh, the grace of God which was given among the churches of Macedonia. So, one thing, um, uh, first of all, he, he begins with this, this Adel Foy, he often calls um, his epistolary audiences brothers. Uh, so I would encourage you to use brothers, not brothers and sisters, as has become fashionable, because I think he's writing especially to either clergy, the leaders of the church, or at least to uh, husbands who are um, set over their wives. So, you know, the, the masculinity of the phrase, I think, can be emphasized without being sexist, of course. So, uh, he also begins with a, um, what's known as a, uh, a disclosure formula. Uh, we make known to you, okay, and it takes a dative object. Uh, we make known to you, gno ridzelmen who men. Um, it, it's one of the formulas that are used for the main body uh, of a letter. And uh, uh, there are very few formal markings for the main body of a letter, but that's one of the few that there are. So that's how this section begins then. So make known to you the grace of God. Okay, so what I did, I think charis occurs five times in this portion of the letter. 
And uh, so I've put them in red. Um, and usually you'll see that charis occurs with the definite uh, article, tain charin here, and sometimes also the, uh, 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 the non demonstrative um, adjective, like in verse 6, notice it says kai tain charin tau tain, and the grace this one. So it's got that predicate position, which draws great emphasis uh, to grace. And um, that's kind of, if you're, if you're looking to preach this, you know, God's grace in Christ Jesus is what, how this is going to end up. But he doesn't quite get there at first. He, he's rather indirect. So the grace of, uh, of God, which was given among the churches of Macedonia. Now, um, I'm working on Philippians right now for the Concordia Commentary series, and this could well be a... Uh, reference to the Philippians' generosity. They bring the gift to Paul through Epaphroditus. Uh, that's mentioned, his name is mentioned twice in the letter. So among the, the churches of Macedonia, um, uh, uh, Philippi being the most important one, but there were other generous uh, uh, Macedonian Christians too that are mentioned in Acts. Okay, so uh, given among the, the churches of Macedonia. And then we have this hati here, which connects the uh, disclosure formula that um, in pole dokime flipseos he parasea tes katas auton. Okay, that amid much testing of trouble, that's what it says, the um, abundance of their joy and their katabathus tokea, so their excessive uh, poverty abounded unto the uh, wealth of their sincerity or their generosity. Okay, so this is very kind of exalted language. Uh, the Greek isn't really tough, but it, you know, it's Paul's epistolary Greek. And it is a step up, I would have to say, from the Gospels that, that pastors usually preach on. But if you're preaching on this, you kind of have to work with the Greek a little bit. So he really lays it on um, about their generosity, hey parasea here, of their joy. So that would be another connection to Paul's letter to the Philippians, if there is that connection, because joy is mentioned so much in that letter. And then their excessive poverty. So this causes um, some scholars like Peter Oakes, who is a great uh, scholar of Philippians, to suggest that perhaps um, the Philippians' gift to Paul wasn't that lavish, and they gave out of their poverty. So that would be supported by this kind of incidental expression here in 2 Corinthians. Their excessive uh, poverty abounded unto the wealth of their uh, generosity, that tes um, hoplotetos, uh, their simplicity, their uh, single foldedness. Okay, so no duplicity at all, but their generosity is the idea. And then we have another hati. So we've had hati here in verse 2, and now we're going to have it against in again in verse 3, which continues the disclosure formula, that according to power, I testify, yea, beyond their power, they gave. So he doesn't give the verb to give, but that's what's pro, uh, suggested here. Um, of their own accord, authyretoi, okay, um, with great encouragement, um, asking us, De amanoi he moan, so this is a participle, of course, and it patterns with this genitive, this ablatival genitive. Uh, if you know some Latin, uh, peto a te, I request of you, a te. And the de amai is kind of functioning uh, similarly here, asking of us for the favor. So the second time te karen occurs, and the fellowship of the um, of the ministry, which is 
toward the saints. So he's using this language charis here kind of technically, okay? Um, he's playing with the word. Um, here it has to do with the fellowship offering, with the collection of the saints, uh, or the collection of the churches for the saints in Jerusalem. And you have this use here of tain koinon, koin, koinonion, the fellowship, the sharing of the ministry or of the offering toward the saints. Um, and then he goes on in, in verse 5, and not as uh, we had expected, ALP Salmon, but uh, they gave uh, themselves first to the Lord. So that's the way good giving is. It's always a giving of oneself first. So it says it right here, to the Lord and to us, he, can, he includes, uh, through God's will, uh, so that we have ace now plus an articular infinitive, so that um, hamos teton, okay, and then this, this infinitive. So this hamos is probably the subject of the infinitive. I'll put a little s over there, and teton is the object, okay? so that we encouraged Titus, okay, in order to, and then we have a henna clause, and this is the content of the, of the encouragement. It's a content clause, really, you can't really say its purpose, that just as he had begun, so also he might conclude toward you all, uh, indeed, this favor, okay? So, um, who is Titus? Well, Titus, of course, is, uh, you have Timothy and Titus. Timothy is, uh, is Paul's emissary uh, to Christians who were circumcised, and Titus is the one to Christians who were uncircumcised, that is, to Gentiles. And Paul works uh, through Titus, especially with the Corinthians. So that's why he's, his name is mentioned here so that we might encourage Titus that as he had begun, so begun what? Well, apparently this, this uh, offering uh, for the Gentiles, so also he might conclude toward you also this grace, this favor, this offering. So it has a technical meaning here. This is the third time that it's used. Well, let's keep moving here. If we could scroll up, John. Uh, uh, but, uh, verse 7, uh, just as, there we go, that's good. Just as um, in every way uh, ye may abound, and then he itemizes the ways that they may abound by faith and by word or uh, teaching and in knowledge and with all zeal. Okay, so he mentions four things there. The Corinthians are rich, they're financially rich, and they're rich in the gifts of the Spirit, as we see demonstrated here. And then the last one is, I put this in bold, and in uh, the love from us among you. So he's saying <laughs> that the Corinthians are rich in Paul's love for them. That's how you're rich. And you know the Corinthians are not always on the best side of Paul, so he's, he's putting kind of a delicate matter uh, gently and perhaps ironically here. Paul has a touch of a sense of humor, I'd have to say. Um, in order that, now we have another uh, part of the content clause. We have henna again, okay? And so when you see henna, you would, of course, expect to see a subjunctive. And there it is right there. So that also ye may abound in this grace, uh, in this giving, uh, in this uh, favor, uh, technical use of charis, um, that you might uh, uh, abound in this, in this gift. Verse 8. Um, uh, now, I do not speak it according to command, but I speak it through your zeal for others, dia tes heteron spudes, and uh, while testing doki mod zone at the last word, the genuineness of your love. So that's, why, that's how Paul says it. He, uh, again, is being um, indirect. He's talking about money, after all. 
and he doesn't want to have any sense of force or coercion to the Corinthians' generosity. And you know there's tension with the Corinthians anyway, so he's treading on eggshells, okay? And as he does, he motivates them through the gospel to give, and he's setting a standard also for our giving, okay? And the giving that goes on in your congregation through your preaching of this sermon. That's what's happening here, if you can see it. And then we get to the to the really the gospel in the narrow sense in verse 9. For you all know the grace, Tain Chiron, the fifth time that he's used, used the word, of our Lord Jesus Christ, that for your sake, de humas, O Corinthians, he was impoverished, though being rich, plusius own, so concessive use of the participle there, in order that you, humes, subject nominative, may abound uh, uh, by, uh, be rich by that one's, ekenu, poverty. Okay, so you have here an instance of the great exchange. We are rich because Jesus became poor for us. Jesus was rich and we were uh, impoverished because of our sin and our neediness, but because of Christ, he has given us all things so that now we're rich and we can indeed give some of our hard-earned money for others and give joyfully. Okay, that's what's behind all of this. It, just go to town here in your sermon. You know, ham it up because that's what Paul is doing. Okay, now then this last part, he, he has a kind of a lacunae of a, of a few verses and at the very end here, um, uh, and I think what he's talking about here, he's sensitive to the feeling of the, um, that the Corinthians might have that they're doing all of the giving and that the other people are just on the take. And this is a common problem that generous, generous people face, people who have a little bit more money than others. When they're called on to give, they often feel put upon. I have a brother, and that's how it is for him, and I have to be very careful when I'm talking with him about money. Okay? You don't want him to just expect you to, you know, drop the bomb on him. And so, again, that's what Paul is doing here with the Corinthians. Um, for uh, it's not that, uh, uh, verse 13, for it's not that uh, others have onesis, that they have a relaxation and you have trouble. And he's talking about the, the onerousness of giving. But that your giving may be ex isotetas, from equality. Okay? Um, for in the time now, um, your uh, abundance um, avails to the lack of them, okay, in order that also their abundance, ta ekenon parasuma, may become, may avail to, your, to what you are lacking. So he's basically saying, that God has blessed you now to be rich to others, just as in your time of need, he will bless the, the Christians in Jerusalem or whatever to be rich in your time of need. And that's how it is in the church. We don't give in order to force people to give back to us, but we give with a generous heart. God blesses us. It's, it's all from God anyway, not really us. We're merely the stewards of what God gives. And then we can be generous, and then uh, as we have need, uh, other Christians who we may have blessed earlier uh, will uh, requite us, okay? And that's how it is also with the gospel. Some of the people that we evangelize and teach the gospel to come to faith, and their churches grow and flourish, as is happening in parts of Africa, and then they can help us impoverish, spiritually impoverished Americans. Okay, I go to Africa and I see this all of the time, all right? So that's what Paul is talking here about in wonderful Greek that's a bit of a challenge for you, but that's okay. Um, uh, so that there may be equality, he says in verse 13. Hutos genetai isotes. Uh, just as it is written, and then he has this passage from, where is it again? It's a quotation from Exodus 16, 18. So, and this is kind of tricky, 
Septuagintal Greek, see how it's italicized, that the one that gave much uh, did not overgive or have too much, and the one that, that took a little, hata oligon, did not run out. And he's talking here about the, the miracle of the manna, okay, and the quail. And you can recall that um, they were to take the manna six days of the week and take a double portion on the last day of the week that would last them for the Sabbath day when they could not work. And they were all to take an omer. That was the, the that was kind of the, the currency of giving. And a, an omer, don't you know, is one-tenth of an ephah. Did you know that? <laughs> So how much is an ephah? Well, it doesn't really matter. But the point is there was a miracle there, and Paul uses it. He sees a fulfillment in the, in the giving of the Corinthians, okay, with what was started in the Old Testament with the manna, how God supplied the people of, of Israel in the wilderness, just as he supplies us now by his grace and mercy and the gospel and all the things that we enjoy. Um, so we can afford to be generous. This is a great text. Just to jump right into the Greek and preach it for all your worth. God bless you as you do. Thank you.